We'll just do that again, shall we? Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I, made I always make sure that I switch it off between services because you really don't want to know all of my, um, my conversations between service one and service two. I just forgot to switch it on. I do apologise. Uh, so my name is Philip McDonald. I'm one of the leadership team here at City Gates. It's, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to give you a really warm welcome this morning uh, to City Gates Church. Uh, I'll be leading the first part of, of the service and then Liam our assistant pastor, also part of the leadership team, will be uh, speaking to us from Luke's Gospel. Um, you're very welcome. Whether you're new here, visiting, been here a long time, it's great to have you with us. And we really hope that you'll feel comfortable and able to join in uh, this morning. Um, one or two familiar faces are, are missing. They're in Mississippi in, uh, in the USA. And we'll say a few more words uh, about that a little later on in the service. I think it's worth saying at the start just to set the scene a little bit our children and teens will be staying with us right through the service so including the sermon uh, today we'll be worshipping as a whole church family. Um, we're really thankful to God for all of our volunteers and so uh, every so often uh, we think it's good one all to be together to worship together as a church family but two to give our uh, young church volunteers just a little bit of a, of a break. Uh, so, uh, so we're all in uh, together. If you're aged 5 to 11, hopefully you'll have picked up an activity pack on your way into church this morning. Uh, that's for use during the sermon. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm 5 to 11 and I didn't get one, they're just outside the door. So don't be afraid at some point in the service to, to get up uh, and we'll make sure that you've, you've got one. Um, parents, if you've got a child under 5... The bridge room is open, so that's out of this door here, turn left and down the corridor. That room is open throughout the service if you think your child, or indeed you, might like a little more space. So the service is being streamed through there so you can still hear um, what is going on. The other thing perhaps to mention just at the start is we're going to share communion together and we're going to do that after the first uh, couple of songs. So if you haven't got a little uh, a glass of juice, uh, and a piece of bread uh, they're just over there in the corner so we'll um, we'll make sure you get one so if you're sitting there thinking oh, I've got one we'll make sure you've got one uh, before we do that let me read to you a verse from John's gospel a familiar uh, verse to many of us I guess John chapter 3 and verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life let's pray father god thank you so much that you loved the world so much that you gave your one and only son to jesus and whoever believes in jesus shall not perish but have eternal life father we pray that that truth will ring out in all that we sing and say and do this morning we pray, Lord, that for those of us who know Jesus, Lord, we pray that we'll be drawn ever closer to him. And for those of us who perhaps haven't uh, discovered quite who he is yet, Lord, I pray that he will become real this very morning. For we pray it in his name. Amen. We're going to sing and reflect some of the words in, in that verse of scripture. Uh, so if you're able to, uh, please do stand and join with me as we sing and worship God together. <laughs>
So we've come to the part in our service where we're going to share uh, communion. Uh, so uh, if you haven't got a little uh, cup of juice or a piece of bread, don't be afraid to just wave your hand or arm or something. And the guys in over there will make sure. In fact, I think they've done a brilliant job because everybody's got one. It's fantastic. Ah, just one at the back. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, as we were thinking, thinking earlier when we were, were praying before the service, we we're talking about how you explain something that is so profound and yet um, we want to do so in a relatively simple way as we're all in uh, this morning and, and, I, and I guess when I was, was thinking about it I was thinking in terms of, of pictures I don't know about you um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember photograph albums I didn't bring mine because I thought I'd embarrass myself uh, and um, half the congregation probably don't know what a photograph album is but um, all my photographs these days are on my phone um, I did look the other day, I've got over 3,000 photographs. So that's because I keep going tap, tap, tap and not deleting the ones that aren't very good. Um, but I've got all sorts of, of photographs on my, on my phone. I've got photographs of, of holidays. <coughs> I've got photographs of family. I've got photographs of things that I've done at work, which I've then uploaded onto social media. I've got a photograph of when I w last went to the cricket. I'm a big cricket fan, so I was at Lords for, well, it would have been England against somebody, but um, just capturing the scene. I wanted to remember. I wanted to remember who I was with and what was going on around me. I wanted to remember the environment and th that it would help me to remember how I felt, who was playing. And um, so that's the sort of thing I guess uh, lots of us probably now do. And when we take photographs, it's to help us. And we look back and we think, oh, yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, I remember being there. And um, when Jesus went back to heaven to be with his father, he left us behind a picture to remember him. It isn't a picture in an album. People have tried to create this picture. For those of you who have heard of Leonardo da Vinci, a famous artist, he tried to capture it in, in, a, in a picture called The Lord's Supper probably doesn't look quite as it looked all those years ago but we try and capture things but but um, what Jesus did he wanted to us to remember not what he looked like but a picture to remember who he was and what he did for us and we call it the Lord's Supper we call it communion as well so just before Jesus was crucified he called his disciples together for a meal and uh, when they were eating he took a piece of bread and he told the disciples that the bread was to remind them of his body that would be hung on a cross. And then he took a glass of wine and he told them that the wine was to be a reminder of his blood that he would shed for them on the cross. And he told them, whenever you eat the bread and whenever you drink the wine, you should be reminded of what I have done for you and we still eat the bread don't we and drink the wine today and when we do it helps us to remember what Jesus has done for us so this morning we're going to remember Jesus and we're going to thank him for being willing to come to earth and die on the cross and he did that so that we might be forgiven for all the wrong things that we've done and as we reflect even across this last week or two perhaps if we think back to when we were at school maybe we're a bit mean to our friends on the playground maybe we said some things that were a bit hurtful maybe we weren't very nice to our mums and grown-ups well what might we have thought and said and done which upset God upset other people was just the wrong thing to do so we're going to say sorry um, uh, this morning, first of all. We're just going to reflect just for a few seconds and just think in our hearts quietly of those things that we, we've done, things that we've said, things that we've thought that we wish we hadn't have done and which have upset others and have upset God. So we're going to do that for a moment. So we're going to close our eyes and just be quiet for a few seconds and we're going to say sorry to God for those things uh, that I've uh, mentioned.
Father God, thank you that we can take this opportunity to reflect on uh, those things that we have done and said uh, that have been wrong. Thank you that we come before a God who forgives and forgives and forgives, who loves to hear from us, who wants us uh, to be more like Jesus. Father, thank you that we can say sorry uh, this morning. Help us, Lord, uh, to do better. Help us, Lord, to look to Jesus as our example. And thank you, Lord, that um, we don't have to um, beat ourselves up about it, that Jesus died on the cross that we might be forgiven. And if we trust in him, uh, then you will forgive us and you will make us right with you. Thank you, Father. Amen. So we're really grateful, aren't we, that we've got this picture uh, that we can think about. And so now we're going to to take the bread and the wine. And uh, you may recall in the Bible it says these words, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, this is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to take the bread and eat it and remember um, what Jesus did for us, that his body was broken on the cross. So let's do that now. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me so we're going to to drink this and remember jesus blood that he shed on the cross Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving us this picture to remind us of what you did for us when you died on the cross. Help us to, be, to remember and help us to be thankful. Amen. We're going to sing. We're going to sing a song that I hope uh, all the children know. Um, it's called God Speaks and We Listen. And Liam has very kindly offered to come and do uh, some actions for us. Now, I think it'd be a shame if Liam had to do the actions on his own. You might see it differently, of course. <laughs> um, but I just wonder, young people, would you like to come and do... do you, does anybody know the actions? Do you want to come and do them with Liam? I, he'd be ever so grateful. There's a bit... I can see a bit of persuading and arm twisting going on. I can see a lot of reluctance. I'm rubbish at this. I can't sing and do the right actions at the same time. So it's... it's you know, I'll, I'll try, but... No? Got no takers? I don't know. It's all right. Yeah? You'll be all right, Liam? Okay. Let's sing. God speaks with us. And please stand if you're able.
and Liam. He got a round of applause in the first service, but I think that's because there were four young people. But seeing the enthusiasm out there, I should have widened the age range, shouldn't I? We've got some really enthusiastic, th enthusiastic uh, actions there. Brilliant. But the words are so important, aren't they? We're going to do some notices uh, now. Um, there are several uh, to mention. So starting with our Easter offering, it's a reminder to you, our Easter offering is open. We're supporting the work of Tear Fund in the Middle East. You know what's happening, as it were, in Israel and Gaza, and Tear Fund are working really hard in that area. So we're supporting them uh, in Church Matters, which is our, our weekly newsletter. It tells you how you can uh, contribute, box at the top of the stairs, and many uh, other ways. Um, we're expecting Ashley and Jody next weekend. They've got their accommodation sorted uh, and they're traveling down from Edinburgh. So uh, we're excited that Ashley's coming to work here, excited that the family uh, are joining us. We have an induction service for Ashley uh, next Sunday at 10 o'clock, refreshments after the service and weather permitting. Sorry? Beg your pardon. I'm getting ahead of myself or behind myself. Uh, 21st. But I better say that loudly for the, for the uh, live stream as well. So yes, two weeks today, 21st for the induction service. So hopefully, if, it, if the weather is fine, we'll go off to Waterloo Park for a picnic after that. We'd, uh, we'd like to welcome them, um, with a, perhaps with a financial gift as well. We'll, we will warm, warmly uh, welcome them as a family. Um, but uh, we're suggesting we, we might want to, to, uh, to welcome them with a financial gift. If you'd like to contribute to that, you can do that in all the normal ways. Clearly, there will be two things going on here, the Easter offering uh, and potentially then if you're giving to Ashley and Jody uh, to, to help them as they start here. So just please make sure you label your, um, your gifts appropriately. The third thing is to say that a team are from here, 15 people are in Mississippi. And Mississippi is in the United States. It's a southern state, uh, east northeast of Louisiana. Uh, Ellisville is quite south in, in Mississippi near the, uh, near the Gulf Coast. And they're helping a church in Ellisville with their mission that, that starts tomorrow. And uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a video uh, that we want to share with you. It's been made by them. They sent it through to us. Thought they, they thought we might like to see what's going on. So here goes.
surprises for those of you who can uh, guess the recurring theme there. Um, you have to like fish or a big breakfast, don't you, uh, to be over there. But uh, they look as though they're having a good time, and it's great, isn't it, to be able to share in what's going on so far away. I don't know, what is it, three and a half thousand miles or so. Uh, so the final thing to mention uh, briefly um, is that we're w- we welcome new life uh, this week. On Friday, Isaac John Hallier uh, was born uh, to Beth and to James and to Hattie. So they were here with uh, Beth's mum and dad at, at the first service. Well, n- not, not Beth, uh, James and Hattie were. So we were able to congratulate them in person. But that is, that's Isaac and he's seven pounds, nine ounces. Um, which I think is an important fact for some people, isn't it? And he was born at 8 o'clock on Friday night. I think I've got it all in. Um, I didn't do it all at the first service. I forgot the wait, uh, as someone reminded me afterwards. So, yes, so uh, so we rejoice with them uh, and their new life and their their, uh, their bigger family. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we want to give you praise for new life. Thank you for the birth of Isaac Thank you, Lord, that uh, he's born into a, a family uh, of, of James and Beth and Hattie. Father, I pray that they will soon bond. Uh, and Father, I pray for, for Isaac's development, for, that he will grow in strength. And Father, we do pray that one day he will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Saviour and Lord. Father, as we think about youngsters, Lord, we think about Mori um, uh, and uh, Isaac and Toomey. Uh, Father, we we thank you for having your hand upon that situation uh, for these weeks, Lord, and we now pray for increase in strength and development there and that you'll be with parents too, Lord, as they spend some of the time uh, separated from little Mori. Father, we think about those who are struggling at the moment, Father, those who are grieving. We think of the Green family. Father, we pray for Amanda and Leah, for Andrew and Sonia and wider family. Father, we pray that you will be extremely close to them at the moment, that you will be their rock and you will be their support as they go through this extreme time of sadness. Father, we want to thank you for all that's going on over in Mississippi. Thank you that we can contribute uh, by sending resource to work with them. Pray for Andy, particularly today, Lord, as he speaks uh, at the service at Ellisville. Father, we pray that you will be his all in all, that you will enable him to speak clearly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for these next days as the mission gets into full swing. Pray, Lord, that many souls will be saved. Pray for good weather, uh, that people will, uh, will turn out and will hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for Ashley and Jody's imminent arrival. And uh, Father, we pray that you will be with them as they journey. We pray that they will settle in quickly into Norwich in in every way. And Father, as we think about our Easter offering, Lord, we're conscious of all the difficulty out in Israel and Gaza. We confess sometimes we don't even know quite what to pray. Father, we do pray that by some miracle, Lord, you might bring hostilities to an end. Father, we pray that you'll raise up those who are interested in peace and in talking and in working together and in love. Father, I pray that you would work mightily in that region. And Father, I pray you would work mightily here this morning. Lord, thank you that we've been able to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. And as we uh, now hear from your word and as we listen to it preached to us, Lord, we pray that you'd open our hearts to all that you have to say to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have our reading and then Liam's going to come and speak to us. Martha Pierce is going to come and read from Luke's Gospel. Thank you. Our reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35, and it's on page 1061 in the Church Bible. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. Then they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning with us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Martha for reading. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you uh, here today. Thanks so much uh, for coming along. Uh, if we've not met before, my name's Liam. I'm one of the leaders here at City Gates Church. A particularly warm welcome, uh, perhaps if you're here and you're visiting maybe friends and family over the Easter holidays or you're enjoying some time away. Uh, it's lovely to be with you here today. So thank you so much uh, for coming along and thank you to those who are watching online as well on our live stream. Really good to have you with us as well. Uh, we're going to be thinking a little bit more about this passage uh, for about kind of 20 minutes or so. Uh, kids, you know, hopefully, just to reiterate, I really hope you did get one of these kind of activity packs as you came in. Please do have that uh, by you. It's going to help you kind of listen to the sermon um, to kind of stay and to kind of see what kind of God's Word is saying. If you didn't manage to grab one, no worries. There's some just out those doors as you came in. Please uh, do go grab some, grab some coloring pencils uh, as well. Uh, and there is a prize as well for everyone who completes a sheet. There is a prize as well available to you. Uh, just to reiterate, those under 11 get the prize. Okay, good. Uh, as well, if you, you're here today and the kind of you've got little ones with you and they just need you know, a bit of space to kind of, um, kind of run off some energy or whatever it is, they're getting a little unsettled, please do make use of the crash that we have available. That's kind of out the doors where you came in to the left, unsupervised, but the live stream is on in there so you can stay and listen to that uh, as well. Well, I'm going to pray uh, and to ask God for his help as we look at his word together. Heavenly Father, thank you that when we read the Bible... It is your words. We are listening to you speak to us. Help us to have ears to listen to what you say so that we might trust and obey. Amen. Well, I wonder whether you've ever had one of those moments in life where you didn't know something, you didn't realize something, and then all of a sudden, the knowledge just came to you just like that, and everything all of a sudden made sense. We call that a light bulb moment, don't we? It's a little bit like just you don't know anything, you're kind of sat in the darkness and then, ping, a light bulb switched on and suddenly there's light. You can see everything clearly. It's a little bit like that in our passage today. You see, the disciples, they have their own light bulb moment because they go, as we saw in that story, we go from not seeing Jesus, even though he's right next to them, to seeing him fully and we can see what they know about Jesus by the end of the story. Verse 34 says, It is true, the Lord has risen. They see Jesus fully. They see that he has risen from the dead and what that means for them. And so you see our passage today, it's a little bit like a story in that sense. The, the disciples kind of go on this, this journey, if you like, of going from not seeing Jesus to seeing him fully. From not knowing 
that he's even there with them to, to knowing who he is and why he has come and how all of God's word points to him. And so we're going to look at this story and we're going to look at it in kind of three parts. You see, because every story, whether you know, you're reading a story to a small child, to a two-year-old, or you're kind of reading uh, a story, whatever it is, every story has three parts. It has beginning, a middle, and an end. All stories have three parts. So we're going to look at this passage like a story together, starting off at the beginning. Let's see what happens. We see in verses 13 to 18, the disciples are downcast without Jesus. Downcast without Jesus. You see, at the start of a story, what happens is we set the scene, don't we? We want to see, you know, what's going on? Where are we? Who are the main characters? What might I want to expect from this story? Well, here in verse 13, the very first verses of our passage today, we get a big clue. Have a look. It says, right at the start of the passage, now that same day. Now that same day, the, this story is happening the same day as Jesus has risen from the dead. We saw that back in the first bit of Luke 24 where some women visit Jesus' tomb. They see the huge stone in front of the tomb rolled away and an angel is there. And the angel says to them this, the words will come up on screen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He, Jesus, he is not here. He has risen. And so the women are amazed. They run as quickly as they can to go and tell Jesus' disciples, that's his closest friends and followers, to tell them this amazing event. So that's what happened before. This is happening the same day. But here we are on a road out of Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. It's about seven miles away. So it's a little bit like if we were to walk from the center of Norwich out to any of the kind of like surrounding towns and villages that are around the edge of Norwich. Maybe you live in one of those. And so we might wonder, you know, why are these guys walking away from Jerusalem? Why are they walking away? Surely from what the women have said to them, they're, they're amazed and they're thinking, we need to stay put right here and see what is going to happen. What's going to happen next? Could Jesus really be alive? But we also see just in the previous passage, verse 11 how the disciples reacted to being told this news by the women who visited the tomb. They say these words. They say they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. It made no sense to them. They think, you know, we can't believe this because this never could have happened. And so these two disciples, they're walking away from Jerusalem. Maybe they're thinking, well, we saw what happened to Jesus. We're his followers. People know that we were his followers. We're worried that something similar might happen to us. So they don't believe and they want to walk away and to, to get out of there, basically. And so as they walk along, they're talking. It says the passage says they're talking about everything that's happened. Really, they're just processing, aren't they? They're just trying to get their heads around what has gone on. And Jesus appears and walks alongside them. And he asks them, what are you talking about? You know, as you're kind of talking along, what are, you, what are you talking about? And have a look at verse 18. One of them replies, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? These guys are basically, they're amazed, they're incredulous. They're thinking, who is this guy? Has he been living under a rock over the last few weeks? Does he not know who Jesus is? Everyone has been talking about him in Jerusalem and how he has died. How can he not know who Jesus is? And we can see, too, about how the disciples are feeling in this verse, too. It says that they are, are downcast. You see, to be downcast, it's more than just to be a little bit sad or a little bit disappointed. It's a feeling of just great sadness. Great sadness. They are mourning. They're wondering what life is going to look like now for them. How do we make sense of all this? They had all of these hopes in Jesus. They built their lives on following him. But, but now he's died. And so they're wondering what happens next. Where do we go from here? Maybe you've experienced something like that in your life. Just an, a, a set of events or experiences that just leave you feeling so uncertain and you think, how am I going to carry on? What is life going to look like now? 
So that's kind of what the disciples are saying. But maybe you spotted verse 16. Verse 16 is quite interesting. It says, but they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from recognizing him. That's, that's weird, isn't it? Surely, you know, these disciples, they're downcast. Surely Jesus would come along and go, guys, it's me. It's Jesus. I have risen from the dead. The women said what was true. The tomb is empty. I am risen. Surely he should say that. I think maybe that they're kept from, from recognizing him is that what Jesus wants to do is to help them make sure that they see the full picture of who Jesus is. He wants them to see the full picture. Maybe you've had one of those moments where you want to know the answer to something. You want to know a certain kind of piece of knowledge. Uh, and so you ask someone, can you tell me what the answer is? And that person says, I'm going to let you work it out. It can be quite frustrating, can't it? You're like, just tell me the answer. But they say, I'm going to let you work it out. Maybe if you're at school, you've had that experience where your teacher has gone, you just want to know the answer, and the teacher says, I know that you can work it out. I think that's a little bit of what is going on here with Jesus. It's not that he wants them to remain wallowing in their sadness. He doesn't want them to remain feeling downcast. But he does want to teach them something, and he does want to show them fully what has happened to him and why it needed to happen. That takes us to the, to the middle of our story. As, as the disciples see or start to learn who Jesus is, but at first they don't fully see who Jesus is. And that's in verses 19 to 27. I wonder whether you're here and you've, kind of, you've watched the classic TV show, Catchphrase. Okay, it might be something that's a bit of a, you know, people of a certain generation will remember it. But I think, you know, it's still on TV now. There's probably repeats somewhere, isn't there? Basically, if you've never seen it before, there's a big screen, okay, that has a picture on it that has like a well-known saying. So, for example, the saying might be, it's raining cats and dogs. And the image would have cats and dogs kind of raining down. And the contestants have to guess the picture. But what happens is that at first the picture is completely covered by these different pieces. And so the pieces are removed one by one until people can work out what the picture is of. And you see, sometimes the contestants, when they've only had maybe one or two pieces removed, they just throw out just a wild guess at what it could be. They can't really see the full picture. And see, that's a little bit of what's happening with our disciples here. You see, the disciples, they haven't seen the full picture yet, even though they've been told it many times before by Jesus. They don't really see the, fully picture, the full picture. And so they're kind of taking a little bit of a guess based on their limited view. And so there's two big things that they, we're going to see what they say. There's two big things that they don't realize about Jesus. They don't see why he came and they don't see why or how he has risen. So his life and his resurrection. The first one, we can see that in verses 19 to 21. They don't see why Jesus came. If you have a look at those verses with me, we, we get some clues a little bit about what they thought of Jesus. Verse 19 says, Joel Jesus, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Verse 20 tells them a little bit about you know, what happened to Jesus, how he was crucified. And then, verse 21, it says, We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. He was going to redeem them. He was going to set them free from the Romans who kind of ruled over the land. That's what they thought about Jesus. And that is what they expected Jesus to do. And so we can kind of see how those two ideas link together. If you think a certain thing about someone, well, then that naturally starts to develop in what you expect from them and what you expect them to do. You see, it's a little bit like that catchphrase game where the disciples see part of the picture, but they don't see it all. They only see part of the picture. And so that means that they base their expectations on that. We see Jesus throughout his, his life, throughout his teaching, he's always been clear with his disciples of what it would mean to follow him, that he is the Messiah, but he's going to be the Messiah who will suffer and die. He's told his disciples many times what must happen to him and why. 
why it must happen to him. But the disciples, they just simply haven't believed him. Or maybe they just haven't wanted to believe him. You see, the disciples have put all of their hopes on Jesus being this powerful leader. A prophet, like they say, to overthrow the Romans. So when they saw him do powerful miracles, powerful deeds, maybe they heard his teaching, powerful words, they thought, this is the guy. He's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to redeem us and set us free as a nation. We can't lose with this guy. But you see, when the moment when Jesus dies on a cross, that is the moment that they are absolutely devastated. They literally couldn't imagine a world where Jesus would die, even though he said to them that he would. The second thing, they don't realize is how Jesus has risen. That's in verses 22 to 24. The the second bit of what they say to Jesus. And here in this bit, they're almost kind of recalling or recounting what they have heard from those women that very morning. And they kind of retell the story, retell the facts. But I don't know about you, but you you read into it, you kind of get a sense of a tone that they just didn't really believe what was happening. Have a look at a couple of things they said. They said, you know, some of our women amazed us when they went to the tomb. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women have said. But, but they didn't see Jesus. You see, the, the disciples are there and it's kind of like they've got a jigsaw to do. Okay, you know like how with a jigsaw, you look at what the picture is on the box and you use that to make sense of how all the pieces go together. The disciples here, with all of these clues, they've got pieces to the jigsaw. They've, they've heard what the women have said. Some of their companions have gone to an empty tomb. And they've also what, got, what Jesus has said to them throughout his teaching when he was with them on earth. They've got all these pieces. But I think because the picture on the box is Jesus rising again, just again, something that they could not get their heads around. They just can't imagine it. So it means that they they failed to kind of put the pieces together, even though it is right there for them to do. And have a look with me at verses 25 to 26. This is what Jesus thinks about it. He says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? You see, Jesus here is really firm. And he's clear with us too. If we're here today then, and we're looking at God's words, we've got all the pictures, all the pieces, sorry, of, of the jigsaw that we need. But if we fail to go where the evidence leads us, if we fail to see that Jesus has risen, then that means that we fail to see who Jesus is and why he has come. And in the words of Jesus here, it means that we're foolish. We're slow to believe. question is then how can we see jesus more clearly how can we make sure that we see who jesus is clearly of why he came and why he had to die that's the big lesson for us to take today we need to see how all of the bible all of god's word points us towards jesus all of it points us towards jesus that's what jesus does with his disciples here he shows In verse 27, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus is helping them see how all of God's word, it's a little bit like a wheel, if you like. You know, there's going to be lots of kind of bits around the edge of it, but at the center of it, Jesus. Jesus is at the center of it. All of it kind of goes through him. All of the spokes of the wheel kind of find their center there in the wheel and if you take that out then well the whole thing falls apart falls apart and you're never be able to kind of cycle on that wheel that's the lesson that we need to take on board as well jesus is at the center of all of god's words whether we read it by ourselves whether we read it with kind of friends and family whether we hear it through kind of a church on a sunday or through small group whatever it is jesus is at the center of it all and he helps us to see us or see him more clearly through it. 
the final part of the story we see in verses 28 to 35. As we come to the end of our story where the disciples delight in Jesus' resurrection. They delight in Jesus. You see, that's what happens at the end of a story, isn't it? Where kind of all the kind of the threads of the story kind of come together, where everything makes sense. All the parts of the story come together. That's what happens to our disciples here. They, they have that light bulb moment. They realize what is going on. And it happens to them over their evening meal. I mean, like what a tea time that would have been. And we can see that in verses 28 and 29. They invite Jesus to stay with them. Don't carry on traveling. Stay with us. But remember, they don't quite know who Jesus is yet. They don't know it's Jesus. And in the next few verses, they have the ultimate light bulb moments. The light bulb moments above all light bulb moments. Remember, it's that moment where, ping, everything just makes sense to them. Let's have a look at verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They have that light bulb moment. They All of a sudden, they realize it's Jesus. Jesus has been the one that's been with us all this time. We might wonder, why was it that particular moment? Why then did they realize that it was Jesus who had been with them? Well, remember, he's been telling them this whole journey for hours and hours, telling them about how all the scripture points to him. And he's been telling them very specifically how the Messiah had to come and suffer and die. And I think maybe just that, that breaking of breads as they have that meal, I think it reminds them of the last meal that they had with Jesus. That before he died, he broke breads. And he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They remember this meal that they have had with Jesus. And they realize, they finally realize what Jesus has been saying all along. That his death hasn't been this kind of unplanned disaster. He hasn't come to be this powerful leader to redeem or set them free from Roman occupation. He's come to do something far greater for all of us, for you and me here today. To set us free from slavery to sin. And you see, that's why when we celebrate and take this meal together as Christians, just as Philip said earlier, we, we do it to remember Jesus. We don't do it just for the sake of doing it. We don't do it just to, you know, tick that one off the to-do list. And by taking the meal, it doesn't make us a better person. It doesn't make someone a Christian. But we do it because it reminds us of Jesus. That's one of the reasons why we call it the Lord's Supper. Because it reminds us of how he ate that meal. How he was going to be the suffering Messiah whose body would be broken for us so that we could be set free. And so that we could know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's often why we, we call it communion as well. It's similar to the words community, to, to be part of something, to, to know someone. We can know Jesus better through taking this meal as we're reminded of him. Well, as we finish, let's just have one more look at the disciples of how discovering this about Jesus, seeing who he is, see what difference it makes. Because you see, the disciples go, they don't go, well, that was amazing, but you know, time's getting on, it's late. We should probably go to bed so we can wake up early and carry on our journey tomorrow. Now have a look, verse 33 says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They return at once. They head straight back to the place that they had been running away from because they're full of excitement. They've seen that Jesus is alive and they are running back to tell their friends, to tell the other disciples. You see, that's the effect that seeing Jesus fully and truly has. They delight in Jesus. They're amazed. They, they stop what they're doing. They're, you know, they're in the middle of their evening meal, but they throw down their knives and forks. They grab their coats and they leave to head back another seven miles, back to Jerusalem, probably going through the dark of night. And they arrive back in Jerusalem. You know, they want to round up all their friends to tell them what they have seen. So they're there, they're banging on doors, they're waking up people to say to them, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. 
I'm sure, you know, lots of us, we don't like being woken up in the middle of the night. But this is too good a news not to wait until morning. What does this mean for us then? As we, we consider this passage, you see, over the last few weeks, we've remembered and celebrated Easter. We not only remember Jesus' death for us, but we celebrate and delight in that he is risen. That he has done all that he promised he would. He has defeated sin and death. He has given us new life with him. And so we can delight in that, just like the disciples do here, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And as we look at God's word, we see accounts of it. Helps us to know the truth of it. And we're reminded that all of Scripture points us to Jesus. You see, we don't want to be like those catchphrase contestants who only see part of the picture and they just take a guess at who Jesus is. And maybe that's a question we can ask ourselves. Do I fully see who Jesus is? Do I see the full picture? Or am I making just assumptions or guesses? Or do I have wrong expectations based on the limited view that I have? This passage helps us to see why Jesus came and how he has risen. So let's praise him and pray that we would see him more clearly. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words. That all of it shows us who Jesus is, Lord. And we see this account of Jesus' resurrection appearing to the disciples, Lord. We thank you so much that you have defeated sin and death and you have risen again. And we can have great confidence and assurance in that you have done that. You have done everything you promised you would do. Help us to respond in faith, putting our trust in you to see you more clearly through your word so that we might trust and obey and live it out in our life. Lord, please give us eyes to see Jesus more clearly, the wonder of him and how he is worthy to be praised. Amen. We're going to finish our time together by singing one more song in response. We're going to sing a song called, Oh Great God of Highest Heaven. It's just a really helpful song because it talks about how we too have been blind to who Jesus is. Blinded by our sin, and yet by God's Spirit, He has opened up God's Word to us. Shown us more clearly who Jesus is by His Word. And so that we can respond in praise and glorify Him. Please stand and let's sing together.
Well, again, thank you so much uh, for coming along today. Don't feel like you need to rush off. Please do stay around and chat. We'd love to get to know you uh, a little bit better. If you're here today and you're perhaps thinking through like who Jesus is, what Christianity claims, and you're kind of thinking about that more, uh, can I encourage you? There's probably one of three steps you can take. The first one of these is if you're thinking, what is kind of the evidence for the resurrection? You know, how can we know that this is true? Can I invite you, uh, listen to Andy's sermon from last week. You can watch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, be really helpful for you to, to kind of listen to that and probably answer some of the questions that you have. Secondly, please do come back next week as we look at, again, another account of Jesus' resurrection, the next passage in Luke 24. And then the final thing is please do uh, come along to Hope uh, Explored. Uh, Hope Explored is basically a three-week course which we run kind of, um, kind of fairly regularly, helping people to explore what Christianity is all about and how following Jesus gives um, the best hope, the best peace, and the best purpose in life. We have another course starting on April the 22nd. Um, to sign up, just kind of go to our website. Uh, you can also take one of the cards from the welcome desk downstairs uh, as well. But yeah, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, let me just pray for us uh, as we finish. These words are in Luke 24. The angel saying to the women in the tomb, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you that while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, as we've looked at your words, to remember your words to us, that we can see you more clearly by looking at your word, the Bible. All of it points us towards Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you have defeated death and risen against that we can enjoy new life in you. Help us to live that out. Help us to glorify you in the way that we live, Lord. Please give us the, the strength and the energy by your spirit to do that, Lord. We thank you that you are a great heavenly father, Lord. Help us now as we go out this week to remember these words and to praise and delight in Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Kids, well done for being in today. If you've got a completed activity sheet, come find me. Uh, I'll give you that reward. Cheers, guys. <laughs>